Greetings and welcome to an LGR Q&A thing. And yeah, this is a reward tier on the LGR Patreon page. So people that have signed up for that get to ask me questions and I'm gonna answer them, or at least the best of my ability and the ones that I can answer, not like yes or no ones. And this is uh, also the computer that I recently put together that we're gonna be using. This is the new XT Turbo clone PC thing, which is really awesome. And I don't know, I just wanted to use it. So that's what we're gonna be doing here. And yeah, first question, let's just go ahead and get to it. This is from Greg Thompson. Over the course of 10 years, has the process of creating videos become easier with regards to script writing, filming, editing, and overall workflow? No, <laughs> it's gotten harder. Absolutely, because I keep upping my game, so to speak. You know, better cameras, microphones, lighting, editing, and all sorts of effects and stuff that I didn't normally do. And uh, really just the whole thing. <laughs> is way harder than it ever was before, and that's totally my own fault, but I think the results are worth it. 13 Cubed asks, what's involved in the production of a typical LGR episode? How much time is spent writing scripts, filming, editing, etc.? Well, all those things you just mentioned are involved in the production. Uh, other than that, I mean, yeah, I could probably do like a making of video at some point. I kind of did a while back, and it was just like a time lapse. It wasn't too involved, and I also might want to do a video about equipment, because people ask me about that all the time. But yeah, it's <laughs> how much time is spent. It depends, you know, anywhere from 20 hours for a really easy video or even less for something like this, all the way up to 60, 70, 80, who knows how many hours because sometimes videos are just spread out over a course of months or years or who knows. Elon Iten asks, how do you come up with the topics for your videos? A mixture of stumbling around the rabbit holes of the internet and late night eBay searches and yeah, just whatever I'm feeling on any given day of the week. It changes week to week, you know? Sometimes I'm feeling like an Oddware episode or putting together a Tech Tales or um, maybe I've got something I wanna build or repair and that's just been sitting around for a while or you know, enough footage comes together for thrifts and it's like, okay, I may as well edit that this week. It just depends, honestly, I have no system. <laughs> no system whatsoever. Star Kindler Studio asks, what is your favorite segment slash content to make? The stuff that makes you feel super accomplished getting done, regardless of views or revenue. Definitely LGR Tech Tales, no question there. It's just that it has the most research and the most detail and a lot of little things that have to come together to make like a cohesive looking video. You know, finding the right imagery in newspaper articles and magazines and screenshots and video. Yeah, it's just a really rewarding thing to put together. I, I wish that I had more time to do more of them. Logan King asks, a lot of your videos seem to have really long lead times nowadays where you have to track down a specific version of some software from 25 years ago to even see if the hardware you bought works. How do you keep track of all the things? Lists, mostly writing things down, putting it in calendars, setting reminders for myself on my phone or computer or whatever. Uh, yeah, just <laughs> basic organizational stuff. And also I have a shelving unit over there full of other LGR projects that are in the works. So every time I see it, I feel shame and pressure. That helps. Pute H asks, which of your computers are you most proud of? Well, recently I'm really proud of the new XT here, or the <laughs> Nuxt Cube, as y'all have started calling it, which is actually quite clever. I wish I'd thought of that. But anyway, yeah, the Nuxt Cube, I like this, but I also like, you know, the Woodgrain 46 and things that I've done repairs on and augmented with other parts. You know, anytime there's like blood, sweat, and tears going into a project, it makes it more special. So. Yeah, but generally I guess I'm most proud of whatever I've worked on most recently. Hmm. Chris asks, why wood grain? Or more specifically, what originally made you interested in that aesthetic? I guess it probably comes from growing up around it. You know, I had a lot of wood paneling and stuff at home and grandparents and everybody's houses. I don't know, there was wood, wood grain everywhere. I, so anyway, there's a nostalgia factor, but beyond that, I don't know, I just like the way it looks. I like natural textures on things. I love original, like natural wood that actually comes from trees. You know, as much as I like veneers and vinyls and stuff, those tend to have repeating patterns. But when you don't see that so obviously, and it's cut from different parts of the tree, that looks really cool. <laughs> I don't know, I just like wood grain. However, I don't like it on everything. You know, that's another thing that some people seem to get sort of misconstrued. I just like it on certain things, you know, mostly electronics, especially up against like brushed metals. Uh, brushed nickel and wood look great, or like a nice walnut which, uh, with a flat matte black kind of textured finish look great. I like certain things. I like wood grain. That's how it goes. 
Here's a question from a bunch of people. It was all kind of similar, so I put it together. From Joe Boxer, Adult Sword owner, Rob Caporetto, and Dave Langley, what's your collecting holy grail? What hardware have you sought out but just can't find? If money and space and availability were no object, what would you get? Well, if nothing at all was any object, I'd probably get something crazy, huge, historical monstrosity, like a 60s IBM mainframe or something. But yeah, I don't even know if I'd really want that because what would I do with it and what in the world? <laughs> but uh, yeah, like actual personal holy grails or like machines that I had as a kid or specifically the machine that I had as a kid, like an old Packer Bell or the Acer or something, but they're long gone. You know, they were either trashed or just gotten rid of in some way. And I can never find them again because that was an exact machine. Even if I find the exact same model, it'll never be the same computer. So yeah, my holy grail are machines that genuinely no longer exist. Will Herman asks, what do you think is the future of edutainment software, especially considering how most children use phones and tablets instead of PCs? I don't know, I'd say I'm pretty hopeful about the future of edutainment. I mean, admittedly, I'm not like in that world. I don't have kids. I'm not looking up uh, tablet edutainment software, but I do know that like kids nowadays are way more tech savvy than I was at earlier ages than ever, and they've got access to more and more stuff. So hopefully that means there's more edutainment opportunities. I, I'd say overall, I'm hopeful, although I'm just not too familiar with the current state of edutainment. Brian Walker asks, do you think more modern tech will offer as much nostalgia factor in the future as the stuff you feature now? Of course. I mean, nostalgia is gonna affect everybody at some point and as you get older and you start thinking about your past and then that feeling comes up and you get all warm and fuzzy inside when you see some piece of technology that you used to use as a kid or whatever so yeah people nowadays are going to be nostalgic for the xbox one and the switch and all that kind of stuff eventually and that's just how it goes there's like a study talking about the age ranges that you're really most nostalgic for it's like 6 to 14 or something and like everybody is just sort of stuck in that period in their head in terms of the things that they want to go back to in their 30s. I, I don't remember what the specifics were, but nostalgia seems to be pretty universal. Andrew Davenport asks, if you could only have one computer and two games for the rest of your life, what would they be? How much can I cheat on this question? Like a modern machine that can just emulate everything, but I don't think that's really what you're asking. So if I had to pick just like one, it'd probably be like a late 90s Pentium 3 Windows 98 machine or something so I could run Duke 3D and other DOS games. So yeah, uh, my two games would be Duke 3D and <laughs> Duke 3D Atomic Edition. <laughs> Zykes asks, what's your all time favorite Sims expansion? That would have to be the Sims hot date without question because it's the one that really opened my brain to the possibilities of the Sims series. You know, it brought Sims out of the house and off their home lot and gave them a world to explore. That was super cool and it just made me super optimistic about the future of the sims and you know at every iteration has got to be better than the last one right and i really wish that was true tristan waddington asks what's your life like outside of lgr can we get a tour of your neighborhood and favorite coffee shop probably not at least not until i leave this area because i don't want to show my neighborhood or anything like that I, that's just too personal i don't like doing that i don't even like showing my house i've never really shown my house but my life outside of lgr is Pretty normal, I don't know. <laughs> I, I go around and, and, and do life things, like a person. Margaret Ransdell Green asks, what modern games are you currently playing? Let's see, right now, uh, well, I'm working on a review for Ion, <laughs> I always said Ion Maiden, it's called Ion Fury now, cause pff, lawsuits or whatever. Uh, and also <laughs> something else that was affected by legal junk, uh, Jupiter Hell, which is actually a sequel of sorts to Doom RL which that was Zenimax threatened to cease and desist. And yeah, man, all these legal trouble games. Uh, and I'm also playing through Judgment on the PS4. So it's uh, in the Yakuza universe, maybe the same developers, but it's not like a Yakuza story exactly. It's more of a detective game. That's pretty fun too. So yeah, those few, I'm playing those. Daniel Lee asks if you suddenly came into an arrangement whereby all the expenses necessary to maintain your current lifestyle were automatically paid, what would you do with your life? I would probably do a lot more LGR. <laughs> <laughs> or like more involved things or something. Like I don't have to worry about any revenue or anything like that. Man, yeah, I'd take like months between videos. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing I don't have all of the money. But if I did, yeah, I'd totally do more of what I'm doing now. Maybe more ambitious, crazy project, or, you know, start a museum or something cool like that. Something like a foundation for preservation or something for computers and software. I don't know, a lot of possibilities. Adriel asks, what is your musical background like? So I've alluded to this in the past and various things. And yeah, I, you know, I took piano and 
guitar and all sorts of things for years throughout childhood and uh, in my teens, I really got into like DJing or whatever and just basically just running like digital audio workstations and messing around with like propeller head software and uh, Fruity Loops and like EJ software and all sorts of things like that, just making my own mixes and stuff. And I, I have some basic understanding of different things and uh, that's about it. I made a bunch of albums, but uh, I mean, you know, it was just for fun. <laughs> There's another set of similar questions from multiple people. Darren, Christopher, and Alex ask, what music do you listen to nowadays? What music do you like that people might not know about? And do you still listen to anything in the genres of techno and trance? Uh, it's funny you ask that last one there, because I actually just bought a bunch of trance vinyl. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I felt uh, the urge. But anyway, yeah, it, that's not what I listen to the most. Um, but to give you an idea of what I do listen to, and maybe what I'd recommend. So I have a playlist I put in the video description so you can check out some of my more recent earworms on YouTube. And uh, yeah, go through there and maybe you'll find something that you like, or at least get an understanding of some of the things that get stuck in my head from week to week. Corbin Davenport asks, what's your favorite Star Trek series? Next Generation, full stop. David Kyle asks, what emerging technology are you most interested in and why? Well, augmented reality is one of the more interesting ones right now, largely because I haven't really tried it much yet, except for, you know, phones and stuff like that. But yeah, the really high-end headset versions, that's super intriguing, just taking a virtual world and putting it on top of your world around you, mixing things together. But you know, right now they got like these smaller field of view things and there's some other weird quirks and stuff. But once you like fully are surrounded in an augmented reality situation, that sounds amazing. I'm really psyched for the future of that. It would just nowhere near, you know, holodeck levels quite yet. Logan Phoenix asks, have you had to scrap any videos? If so, what were they? Hmm, you know, kind of. I mean, there's a lot of videos that I haven't finished, like dozens and dozens of videos that I will do some work on and they're just not done yet, but they're not done yet. That's the qualifier there. So I don't know if they're really scrapped so much as they are uh, permanently shelved. <laughs> until I pick them up again. I don't know, I, yeah, so I guess there's a lot of scrapped videos. It's just, I plan to get back to them eventually, but sometimes they sit there for friggin' years. So that's how it goes, man. Christy Lewis and Mark t -Bomb ask some questions about living places. How was life growing up in North Carolina? How did your family end up moving to St. Lucia? How long did you live there? And would you consider moving back? Let's talk about St. Lucia really quick. Uh, my mother's from there, she was born there. And so that's one reason I was able to get my dual citizenship, both here in the US and St. Lucia. Um, but yeah, we went down there uh, several times, but the longest stint we were there was like six months or something in the early 2000s and just sort of lived there uh, without going anywhere else. <laughs> and that was a crazy awesome experience. And yes, I would love to go back. I'm not sure if I'd live there like, full time, but I mean, I could, I'm a citizen, so that's an option. Uh, yeah, lots of family history on that island. I mean, going back a long ways. And yeah, I was growing up in North Carolina. Well, there's certain parts of the state that I like more than others. <laughs> Where I'm at now in the western part of the state, I do like a lot more than the eastern part. So yeah, you know, mountains and stuff are really cool. I like this area kind of a lot, um, but you know, it's the south, it has its pros and cons depending on what you think are pros and cons. Jim Leonard asks, do you plan on covering any software from the 80s or have you moved on from that time period onto bigger and better subjects? I don't know if bigger and better is a term I would use. It's more like subjects that are more personally gratifying. I've definitely moved on to and just really focused, like narrowed down what I want my content to largely be about. And that tends to be like 90s, early 2000s type stuff. The things that interest me most about early computing stuff is when it can be updated and kind of modernized like this, but uh, I don't know, I mean, I like it all. It's just that I definitely want to focus on the things that are most nostalgic to me, uh, 90s stuff. Friends Pattison asks, what do your family slash friends think of your YouTube career now versus when you just started? Well, when I just started, I don't think anybody thought anything of it. I didn't even think anything of it. I was just doing it for fun, you know? It wasn't money for years. But then once it did start becoming some kind of a living uh, that was interesting, though I don't remember anything like crazy in terms of conversations. Just like, oh, you're, you're doing that now. That's, that's weird, but okay. And that's kind of how it is right now still, you know? Uh, it, it only becomes like more noticeable when we're out in public and like an LGR viewer recognizes me and then, you know, family or friends, it's just like, oh yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. You're a person on the internet. <laughs> and then that's that. It's a weird thing being a YouTuber. Thankfully, I don't have people around that like question it too much or uh, or think that it's like I'm, I'm nuts for doing it. Mostly it's just been very supportive and 
kind of, you know, easy going. Karashata and Eigen ask, have you ever written your own computer game? If so, what was it? And do you have a dream game you'd like to make? Uh, no, I've never, I've never written my own computer game unless you count like really basic things written in basic, <laughs> basic, basic. And in terms of what a dream game that I'd like to make, well, I don't know if I'd like to make it, but I'd love to see it. And that's a sort of all encompassing racing role-playing experience, you know, kind of a mixture of like uh, Test Drive Unlimited and Forza Horizon and like Need for Speed Underground 2 and every, everything. Just like mix all the racing games up, all the really good ones and then have this gigantic open world with extremely realistic stuff, but also in extremely stupid arcade stuff and absurd customization where you can literally go in and like change the vents on your dashboard, man. And like the damage model of Beam and G Drive and just, yeah, yeah, dude, it'd be so cool to have everything. Freakish Uproar asks, what's scarier to you, zombies or ghosts? I gotta say zombies, cause uh, ghosts, <laughs> you know, whatever. They're like translucent stuff, so what are they gonna do? Poltergeist, uh, yeah, it's kind of creepy, but zombies, that's like a reanimated corpse, possibly of somebody you know. That's just terrifying on its own. But zombies I could see maybe being around here if like the right science experiment went wrong or, you know, a weird virus or something reanimating corpses. I don't know, man, it could be possible. So, but ghosts, yeah, I don't really see ghosts. So, uh, zombies though. Nos Days asks, when playing through an adventure game, do you resort to walkthroughs to keep the flow going? If so, do you have any criteria for when you do? Uh, yeah, I absolutely use them, because <laughs> screw that. Who's got time to dick around and never get anything done? Uh, but yeah, like, I don't have any criteria for it. I just pull up a walkthrough whenever I feel like it. Uh, obviously, some games are better than others in terms of that, or, you know, better. They're <laughs> easier. <laughs> Uh, man, I, I kind of miss the universal hint system, if you remember that. It was like a thing that'd give you steps or like stages of hints without spoiling the entire thing entirely like a walkthrough would. I liked that system. Magic Mavic Chen asks, other than retro tech, what other retro items do you collect? And have you seen LGR Thrifts? Pretty much all of that. Retro media, for sure, you know, music and movies, and laser discs, records, tapes, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, all sorts of stuff, like retro lamps, you know, appliances and furniture, and oh man, I love retro furniture. Mid-century furniture, man, holy crap. Probably gonna get an entire room decked out in like Atomic Age stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't know, retro everything. The Enforcer asks, out of all the things you found in thrift stores over the years, what item is your favorite to find of all time? There's a couple that come to mind for sure. That IBM XT that I found in like episode two or three of Thrifts was amazing. Never thought I'd find one of those at Goodwill, much less for a decent price and fully working and cool stuff inside. Uh, but also Space Taxi, I found a complete boxed copy of that for like 12 bucks at a half price books in Illinois. And I was already psyched because that was like a Muse software game that I already liked. But then I got home and did some research and found out that it's insanely rare and extremely valuable, at least if you can even find a copy, which rarely ever happens. So yeah, uh, those two were really, really cool finds. Dave Fazio asks, what do you do with all the stuff you collect? Do you ever sell it to make room for more? Well, I mostly cover it on LGR. <laughs> that's where most of the things that I acquire, that, that's the purpose that I get them for, is to show them. Do I sell it to make room for more though? Sometimes, but I'm honestly more inclined to just give it away, unless it's, I don't know, something that is maybe worth the process of trying to sell it. But uh, yeah, I don't know, I give away a lot of stuff, honestly. I gave away like four or five car loads of things from my storage like six months ago because I'm trying to downsize, honestly. And anyway, uh, yeah, I definitely have to make room for more stuff and kind of try to make it a rule. If I bring in something large, I have to get rid of an equally large amount or sized thing. Emil Olson asks, have you ever considered combining LGR thrifts and traveling, like going to Europe or Japan? Absolutely, I would love to do that. And I don't know where the time or resources are ever gonna come from to make that happen, <laughs> unless I make some serious sacrifices to the rest of the channel for a time to make it work. But maybe, maybe someday, that, that'd be super cool though. Gregory Milks, Kevin Marcou, and Ian Spence asking questions about jobs. What was your dream job as a kid, as a teen? What was your job before YouTube? What do you plan or hope to do after you retire from making LGR? Well, kind of going back to that gigantic computer collecting thing, uh, if I ever retire, I'll probably do something with a collection, either give it away to a museum or start my own. Like, uh, it'd be really cool to have a location and have computer history out on display. But there's a lot of cool places that already do that, so I'd probably give it away to them. Uh, in terms of, like, what I would do, I don't know. Like, I don't really have any plans. <laughs> I'm just kind of milking this for as long as I can, right? Uh, it's just too fun. And I, I'd probably still make videos, even if I did stop making them for profit. I, I just like making videos. 
I don't ever see myself stopping creating, regardless of whether or not it's a job. Uh, but yeah, what was my dream job as a kid? Probably game design. I loved doing level design and modding for any game that I could find that had that support. As a teenager, I wanted to go into art, especially graphic design. That's what I went to college for, didn't finish, but I was trying to go for some graphic design thing. And uh, my job before YouTube, immediately before was making custom picture frames. But before that, you know, I'm a bunch of junk, man. A lot of retail stuff. I worked as an electronics specialist. I work uh, selling makeup. I was in a call center. I did a little bit of a CD factory. W what was this? I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, a lot of weird odd jobs, but custom framing right before LGR or during LGR. Yeah. John asks, how do you have your PC games backed up? Mostly on hard drives, all kinds of them, you know, solid states and spinning disks. And you know, I, I stick it on all sorts of things. I got servers, I got a NAS, I got like online cloud stuff, just wherever. I love archiving all my stuff and also post a lot of things on like archive.org. So uh, yeah, that's, I, I just stick it everywhere, man. Redundancy, man, that's the name of the game. Miles H asks, if you had to pick a specific year of technology to be stuck in, what year would it be? I thought about this, and as much as I'd love to see like the boom of the original personal computing revolution, like 1978 would be a great year, uh, probably 20 years later, you know, sometime in the late 90s, 98, 99, something like that would be great just as an adult going back and re-experiencing all these things that I missed out on. There were just so much going on in the personal computing and gaming space, you know, just <laughs> everything was obsolete after a month and video cards and sound cards and games. And it's just a crazy exciting time for me personally. Augs Peace asks, what's your favorite adventure slash point and click game? You know, it's not really my genre, so It'd probably be something stupid like Hugo 2, because <laughs> those were the ones that I played back in the day. I didn't really get into adventure games until later on in life. You know, in my late teens, I discovered a lot of the Sierra and LucasArts things that I missed out on back in the day. So I don't have too much personal attachment to them. So yeah, I'll just say Hugo 2, because why not? Anonymous asks, what or whom would you say are your influences? Can you identify what inspired your style back in the day? And what's the process that you go through when deciding changes? I've talked about my influences many times over the years, but yeah, it's it's a lot of like the mid 2000s content creators and uh, TV shows and stuff. I love G4 TV and uh, icons and all those kind of things. Those shows were really neat and pretty inspirational in terms of making things like Tech Tales now. But uh, like immediately it was things like uh, the Cinemassacre stuff, AVGN, of course, uh, Classic Game Room. And in terms of the process I go through when deciding changes like to my own format or evolving the show, that's just incremental. I don't really give it too much thought. It's just that each individual video, it's a personal rule of mine to try to in, uh, improve slightly, just one thing. Even if it's just a little bit of an edit or a font choice or a coloring choice or you know equipment or any part of the process, just a little thing better each time and incrementally it gets better over the years. And yeah, just kind of go with the flow and whatever it feels like at the time. Mycophobia asks, ever been recognized in public? All the time, <laughs> especially if I go to anything computer or game related, like events and such. But yeah, I mean, just around town, you know, whatever. Uh, not really in my general vicinity because it was a pretty small little place. <laughs> not too many people watching retro tech YouTube around here, I don't think. But yeah, if I go to any one of the bigger cities around the state, then uh, yeah, definitely. Solar Strike VG asks, have you ever considered starting up an IRC channel or a Discord server? I've considered it and very quickly decided against it because I got too many other things going on and, that, and that's it. I think there's an unofficial Discord LGR thing. I've never used Discord. I don't really have an interest in any of this stuff. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I got Twitter and Facebook and Patreon and email and YouTube comments and all these other things and that's more than enough for me. I feel bombarded as it is. Chris Rogers asking about LGR tech tales and wondering what I would need to make more of them. More time, more money, more demand. All three would be great, <laughs> but mostly time because I know there's demand. It's just a passion project. That's all that is. And I've got to feel pretty darn passionate to put the time into one of those. So yeah, it mostly would be more time. Steve Scafty asks, do you wish to pursue any longer format filmmaking, such as a documentary series and other platforms? You know, not really. I don't really have that aspiration that a lot of other big YouTubers have to like get into making movies or documentaries or TV shows or something. I just like making videos every week about cool stuff that I have. <laughs> That's about it. I've thought about it, sure. It might be cool to have like a feature length tech tales on the history of such and such or, you know, I don't know, something like the person talking about the LGR thrifts going around the world. I don't know, it's not on my radar. I just like making weekly videos on LGR things. Mark asks, when is LGRCon? LGRX, LGR Fest? 
Probably never. <laughs> that's just weird, man. That's a weird thought. Like, I, I guess people would come or something, but like, uh, I don't want to make it more generic than that. Like, just LGR, it seems strangely self-centered or something, but nothing against anybody that makes their own conventions. But I don't want to do, I don't want to do that. I want to make videos. <laughs> Brian Nolt asks, is there a particular controller that brings a rush of nostalgic memories? Yes, and I've covered it in LGR. It's the Kraft, I think the Thunder Stick is what it called. No, it's called the Mac and Cheese Joystick. But yeah, it's just a simple, cheap little joystick that we had back in the day. And that's why it's so special. Every time I use it and play Need for Speed with it or whatever, LHX, it's just a rush. It's so fun. I love that cheap, crappy joystick and I will till the end of time. And finally, Thomas asks, what is your argument to convince newcomers that computer history is worth exploring? Well, for one thing, I just think it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Maybe that's just me, but I don't know, computer history is neat. And it's also just a nice thing to look at the current situation that we're in or the future through the lens of the past. You know, if we don't learn from the past then the future, we're gonna make the same daggone mistakes over and over and over. And in terms of a preservation standpoint, I just think that these things matter and that future generations are gonna want to know about where all of these things came from. And if there's nobody around to talk about it or keep these historical things alive, you know, computers and software and the hardware and the documentation and all this, then what's the point? <laughs> you know, we're just gonna forget about it and, and then what? So it's a combination of things, but it's all important to me. Well, that's it for this Q&A video. I hope that you found something to enjoy here, or some sort of enlightening something or other. Uh, feel free to discuss the things in the comments, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> maybe this will spark some other questions in the future. And if you've got them, uh, feel free to sign up to Patreon and uh, ask for that tier. You don't ask for it, you just sign up for it. And uh, thanks to everybody who's already on there. I just support means an absolute ton, as well as everybody else who's here on YouTube supporting and any number of ways, you know, knowing that y'all have my back is extremely, that's just awesome. Especially when things go stupidly wrong, like data leaks and junk like that. <laughs> Everybody is, you know, on top of that. So I appreciate it. Uh, but yeah, I'm going back to making some other LGR things, uh, upgrading this computer, man. I've got like some different CPUs and ISA cards and I've got a joystick plugged into it now with a game port and everything in there. So I've got plans. So stick around for them if you like. And as always, thank you very much for watching.